Good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And uh, today we're really excited to be uh, launching the virtual launch of John Sanford's brand new Lucas Davidport book, Ocean Prey. <laughs> and uh, down and right side up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, technology has given us the miracle that uh, John's in Santa Fe. I'm here at my home and Barbara's at her home. And so uh, you'll be glad to know that I'm gonna be mostly invisible. Uh, I'll be monitoring the Facebook comments feed. So if you have questions for John, go ahead and type them in there and I'll pop up towards the end of the program to ask some of those questions. And I'll also put a link in the comments field for the signed copies of Ocean Prey, which we just got and they are going fast. So uh, Barbara, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. I'm holding it up and I told John before we started, I went to some trouble to find something in my wardrobe that actually looked like the cover of the book. I felt we should have a nautical theme here. So John, this is publication day. Let me grab my glass of wine and salute you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. We've been doing your book launches for so long, but every single one is so special. I always like to, um, you know, give it a special salute. So this is a particularly grapefruity Chardonnay. So watch my mouth pucker when I drink it. Oh. Mm. Anyway, delicious. So this, you've written, up till this book, you've written 30 prey novels and 12 for Virgil Flowers. So now in Ocean Prey, it's a confluence and the 31st prey novel is also in its way the 13th. Virgil Flowers novel. And I love the way that Davenport brings flowers into, although John, you did have to sacrifice a character to make that happen. And I was really sad to lose him. I don't wanna mention his name because that's a spoiler, but I was really disappointed. Well, tough shit, what can I tell you? <laughs> hey, they all seem real to me. So, you know, it, it's crushing, you know, there I am looking saying, oh, please. Well, you know, the thing, is, the thing is, I've always thought that it helps to keep your readers on their toes. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, and, and have throw some unexpected stuff at them from time to time. And, and uh, I've done it before. And, uh, and so I did it again. And, you know, that's, that's what I did. Hey, you're the god of the book. You get to do whatever you want. So when we were last together at dinner, which I'm afraid was almost two years ago in Santa Fe, you were talking with a lot of enthusiasm about a boat. You were acquiring a boat to be moored in Florida, and you were really looking forward to, because you can't obviously sail at New Mexico, you were really looking forward to going to Florida and having fun on your boat. So I, I did think when I started reading Ocean Prey, was this kind of your, your attempt to make up for the fact that you didn't get to go to Florida and get on your boat? You got to do it writing the book? I, I, I uh... Yeah, well, no, you know, we had spent two weeks on the boat or three weeks on the boat. Uh, we had gone quite a few places. We went up to, to Carl Hyacinth's town, actually, and uh, uh, going up the intercoastal and coming back on the ocean. But uh, so that, that research actually uh, fit into the book quite nicely. I was hoping I could deduct the entire cost of the boat on my income taxes, <laughs> but I don't think the IRS let me do that. So. How true. So that's right. You and you and I launched Carl Hyacinth's um, Squeeze Me last yep. September. And that was that was really fun. That was was that the first time you guys had been together doing an event for a long time? Yes, but we're gonna do another one tomorrow night, I think. Are you? Oh yeah, it's, I think it's for like the Illinois library system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it should be fun. Carl should be able to speak with authority about boats in Florida and, and the good stuff here. So Lucas Davenport, um, U.S. Marshal, you've given him a much broader remit um, than he had when he was uh, Minneapolis comp um, or then a Minnesota, or, you know, more at large. The U.S. Marshals get to go all over. So this, this book starts out with a really electric scene in Florida. You want to set the scene for us? Because it's terrific. Well, it's uh, Davenport encounters a couple muggers walking down the beach. He's sitting on a beach. It's just at dawn. The sun is coming up. He encounters a couple muggers coming down the beach. Um, he gives them $50 voluntarily. Uh, and 
they're a little taken aback by the whole thing and you don't really know what's going on until later in the book. It's, uh, it's actually a flash forward, I guess you'd call it. So yeah, but what we what we do find out um, is that um, careful people are out on the water and there's um, a Coast Guard guy off duty. Well, that's how this book starts. So surely we can talk about that. The off duty Coast Guard guy is out there in his boat. I think he has his family with him, doesn't he? Yes, his uh, toddler and his wife. Right. And they see what looks well, they see a horrible thing happen. Um, they see another boat and they see what looks like divers. And then there's, well, you tell it, it's your scene. Why am I telling it? Yeah, well, what happens, uh, this would be in the second chapter, uh, we are introduced to this Coast Guardsman who is, uh, you know, kind of a happy kid. Uh, and he gets stationed in Fort Lauderdale, but he's also a boat, a boat guy. He's all a long time, grew up that way. He buys a boat that he can afford because it's, it's really a mess and he can fix it. So he fixes it and he's out on the ocean when he sees, as a Coast Guardsman now in his own private boat, he sees a boat that's acting suspiciously. So he calls up the duty officer at the, at the Fort Lauderdale Coast Guard station. And uh, he tells them that uh, this boat looks like it's up to no good. Uh, because what it had done is he come running really fast down the coast. It's got 700 horsepower, uh, two outboards, and it was 700 horsepower, 350 each. Um, and it suddenly stops and it picks up somebody who was in the ocean. And it looks like they're bringing some dive bags, some, some lift bags over the side of the boat. He thinks this is pretty suspicious. So he calls the duty officer at the Coast Guard station and says this boat appears to be heading to the Fort Lauderdale Port Everglades cut, which is a cut through the Otter Island. You can kind of think of Miami Beach. It's not Miami Beach, but it's the same way up in Fort Lauderdale. It's coming through the cut into the port. Uh, and the duty officer says, okay, we'll stop him and take a look. And as I found out down there, that it's quite common for the Coast Guard to stop and check boats. They call them courtesy checks, but they're not. <laughs> they're not, very, they're not very polite. A warrantless search, in other words. Right, right. They're not very polite about it. But they call them courtesy checks. Um, and you can get a lot of trouble with some really odd things like, if, for example, if you've not turned off the valve for the pipe that goes overboard from your toilet, they'll, you really get hurt with the fine, which is good, I think. But, but a lot of people, you know, it hurts them. But at any rate, the Coast Guard boat intercepts the boat coming in. And as it pulls up next to it to do the courtesy check, a guy on the back of the boat shoots the three Coast Guardsmen in this little boat called a rib. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a small boat and uh, it's called a rigid inflatable boat because it's got like tubes on the side of it and then a hard hull. But at any rate, he shoots and kills all three of them. And then the Coast Guardsman who is following this other boat in, but slower because his boat is slower, sees the people in the bottom of the boat, they're dead. His wife is a nurse, he puts her over the side just to into the other Coast Guard boat just to see that they're in fact dead and there's nothing they can do to help them. And then he goes after the fleeing boat. He catches them, but just as he's catching them, the boat goes up in a big ball of flame because they have hosed it down with gasoline, touched it off. He's got a gun, which he's got no chance of hitting anything because the boat's bouncing around so much as he's coming up the intercoastal waterway trying to catch up with them. And just purely by the biggest piece of luck in the world, he hits one of these guys in the head and kills him. And so, when the investigation starts, they've got a body, but it turns out the body is just a guy who's sort of a kind of a dirt bag type of guy uh, who is a known associate of everybody. So it doesn't help them much. The boat doesn't go back to anybody. And of course it burns, so there's no DNA and, uh, and it sinks. Uh, and so, so that's what kicks off the investigation. Three Coast Guardsmen murdered and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a criminal is dead but the FBI is not making any progress. And the reason they're not making any progress is because they're doing all this research, but they're not doing the Davenport kind of thing, which is really putting the screws on people on the street to find out where this might have started. So that's what, that's what sets off the story. It's, it's uh, Lucas, 
And one of my characters from, and from earlier books, Bob and Ray are both in it and uh, Virgil's in it. And um, so the whole kind of crew is there. It is indeed. Um, well, let me go back to the young, the young Coast Guardman. You give him kind of a nice backstory. I mean, he's a kid that, um, you know, doesn't necessarily look like he's going to be promising. He's, um, you know, winds up in the Coast Guard because he wasn't doing all that well in life. And yet here he is, you know, in a moment of when you're tested, you know, this kid rises up. I was really worried that he, well, I know it's a spoiler, but you've already told us that he survived. I was really worried you were gonna blow up him and his family. So that was the first <laughs> moment in this book. I thought, here's this poor kid and he's, you know, yeah. finally gotten into the Coast Guard where he might make something of himself, although it's certainly not clear. Um, and then comes this testing situation and I thought, oh, John, you could be so cruel. You're going to take out him and his whole little family and where are we? But no, no, he gets to go up the coastal inner waterway and his wife, the nurse. So one of the fun things that happens is that you get to take us on a boat show. And I have to say, you know, we have these great car shows here in, in Scottsdale, you know, the Barrett Jackson car auction and you know, Clive Kessler and his wife, Janet, collected cars. So we're kind of used to the whole car show thing. But boat shows are not huge in the desert. But I love the way that you took us through this big boat show in Florida. Um, I gather that you've been to them and you probably yeah. really had fun in them. Well, uh, I am, I am I'm greatly in favor of any kind of a spectacle. Uh, I would love to go to Burning Man and I'm trying to convince my neighbor to take me there. But I've been to like, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Harley Davidson, it's not, it's a motorcycle rally up in Sturgis, North Dakota, uh, mostly that. Harleys, but, but, you know, there are 10,000 Harley riders there. Or John, it was a super spreader um, in 2020. You definitely didn't want to go then. Well, they, I, I mean, you know, the, the governor of North Dakota encouraged everybody to come and then it turned into a disaster. Yes. And, and I mean, they, they, they had, they had riders in from every state in the Midwest, which then, of course, exploded yep. across the Midwest. Uh, but the boat show was like something I've never seen before. I mean, it was astonishing. They had boats there that must have been 200 feet long. And, uh, you know, that's two thirds the length of a football field. Uh, they had, uh, when I inquired about them, it turns out that, that one of them took, uh, to, to fill up the fuel tanks took 40,000 gallons of diesel. That would cost $160,000 for one fill of uh, the thing. And, you know, Davenport says, you know, I ain't a comic, but uh, boy, that's something that's large. And the other thing is, is that the back of these boats have the stern. I mean, they've got a, they've got kind of a deck, but then they've got what in the back of it, what looks like a garage door and all the garage doors were open. One of these huge things had a submarine in the garage. Uh, another one had, what was it? Um, it was, it was something pretty strange. It was one with a submarine, but at any rate, uh, uh, another one had a group of singers. They, they were sort of like, um, uh, sort of like white Supremes singing that kind of a song. And they were all dressed in tiger stripe, uh, uh, dresses. And, um, and they were singing along and doing this little kind of a Supremes kind of thing in the back of this thing. And, and, um, Oh, the other one had a, had a boat. Uh, I used to have a small boat, uh, I mean, a fishing boat. It was 21 feet long. Uh, this boat that was in the boat was at least twice as big as my fishing boat. I mean, it was this enormous boat that was inside the boat. And, uh, and it makes you laugh. And then the, the thing that really made me laugh is that two of these huge gargantuan boats burned the next week. <laughs> Wow. They, they took them up to outfit them someplace and one of them caught on fire and they caught the other one on fire. They both burned. And then like three weeks later, another one of these huge boats lost its engine, uh, engines. It lost its power as it was coming up the intercoastal wa waterway. It kind of slid off to the side and it crashed through about a billion dollars in boats that were, that were moored on the side of the thing. And it was like, and I, I'm saying, you know, what could possibly be better than that? <laughs> no, it's just uh, wow. You know, well, uh, after you know the whole thing with the Suez Canal, I saw the Egyptians today seized that the ship 
because yeah. they, they claim the Japanese ship owner owes them like over a billion dollars. But there was, John, and I thought of you, um, a, a piece in the Wall Street Journal today, which I read for the arts coverage. I'm going to say it right now. I do not read it for the politics. But in any case, um, they had a thing about, um, you know, MBS, the, um, right. the Arabian guy, and his yacht which, you know, is just like beyond belief with helicopter pads and a climbing wall and all this other stuff. But, but apparently when he bought the Leonardo da Vinci, the Salvatore Mundi, for which he paid some insane price, it's on the yacht, which is like the last place in the entire world that you ought to put a fragile painting, you know, expose it to salt air, bad climate control, maybe the boat will I mean, I just could hardly believe it. And now they're not sure where the where the painting is, but it was on his mega yacht, which is sort of the probably bigger than Monaco, if you really think about the size of it. Well, the thing is, is it uh, what I think those guys don't believe, but which I saw illustrated in Fort Lauderdale, those boats can sink. You bet. And, and I mean, if it starts to sink, are you well? I maybe you grab your girlfriend, but maybe you grab the Leonardo instead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, they, the but they blow up and you know um whether i mean one of the huge this is really going off off topic here but i've been there uh twice to the catherine palace in uh the winter palace in saint petersburg and one of the huge criticisms leveled at it is the fact that they don't have any climate control so they have a da vinci and they regularly open the window next to it and the window looks out upon you know the the busy highway and then the river and so the the museum has been very much criticized for the way that it oh it uh, should be well okay so how much yeah, they can afford an air conditioner Right, but how much better could it be to put your leonardo on a yacht <laughs> it was just like really wow Anyway, um, back to the FBI. One of the things that I really enjoyed about this book is that, I mean, why Davenport in the U.S. Marshal Service? Why does he get into this case? And the answer is the FBI just is going nowhere. Um, and I, I really like the fact that, you know, the Marshal Service, according to the way you write it anyway, is a far more freewheeling law enforcement organization than the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Well, the, the thing about the Marshal Service is, is that most of what they do is pretty routine. They move federal prisoners around. Uh, they actually administrate, uh, you know, the, the thing where they hide, you know, various people around the country and stuff like that. The Marshal Service does that. And so some of it's routine. But the other thing that they have is that they also have a group of people who go after fugitives. And that somewhat limits me with Davenport because the people that they go after really have to sort of have been in the system in some way. Um, you know, they, they, because that's what the Marshal Service does. But I, and, I, and I'm kind of playing fast and loose with that a little bit from, from what the Marshal Service really does. But, but they actually uh, are the people who go after hardcore fugitives. And um, so, you know, Davenport chased a guy down to Marfa, Texas and, and killed him there. And he went after this 1919 killer because because there's some ways that the marshal service can kind of get into that kind of thing if they're asked to. Um, but the main thing is that the difference between the FBI really puts a pretty heavy emphasis on white collar crime and, and, and various other kinds of crime that takes some kind of in-depth investigation, the kind of thing that is done by lawyers. Uh, you know, where you're looking at paper, you're talking to people, you're interviewing people, stuff like that. The Marshal Service is more like street cops. And uh, so that's why Davenport became effective in this case, because as he put it in the book, they called him down there to kick over some garbage cans. And that's not what the FBI does. The FBI doesn't kick over garbage cans. They do investigation and they may pick up people who are known associates and they may interrogate them, but if those guys keep their mouth shut, there's not much place to go. Davenport goes down there and he's, he tells people, we can get your cousin out of prison. You know, you wanna get your cousin out of prison? Just tell me a couple pieces of useful information. And that's not what the FBI usually does. Well, it, it certainly appears um, that the FBI is, is fairly highly structured. You know, I mean, they have 
layers of stuff and supervisors and all the rest of it, Lucas seems to be operating. I mean, I don't know whether it's really true of the Marshall Service, but at least in your version of the Marshall Service, Lucid, Lucid, Lucas pretty much operates on his own. Well, he doesn't have a big chain of command to follow. No, he doesn't. And, and he is explicitly outside of the chain of command. Normally, he would answer to the, to the, uh, uh, the, the deputy U.S. marshal in, um, in Minneapolis. But what he got and he devised for himself is political protection. And what he does in a number of my stories is political favors for important people so that he has a kind of clout that most marshals don't have. And he uses the clout, and it's not necessarily entirely on the up and up. Uh, you know that 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 uh, that a U.S. senator will go to the marshal service. This is the guy who decides how much money the marshal service gets, uh, and says, "Could you loan us Lucas Davenport to do an investigation?" He always does those investigations at the behest of a, of a powerful senator. Now, I just finished. I told you earlier before we went on this and, and on on the air here that I had just finished a Letty book. That's Davenport's daughter. This is a book about Davenport's daughter. And she is the same thing. She gets a job that is given to her by a US Senator as a favor to Lucas because he felt that Lucas, that he owed Lucas something. So he agreed to hire Lucas's daughter. Well, he finds out there's a little more to Lucas's daughter than he had, he had counted on. And, and she is just about to quit the job because it bores her. That's what she tells him. You guys bore the hell out of me. And uh, he says, hold on just a minute. I think I can get you something better. And what he does is he gets her a gun and he, uh, he makes her a kind of liaison with the Department of, uh, uh, with, with Homeland Security. Uh, and um, so then that's how the adventure starts in that particular case. I don't wanna to go too much into it, uh, but because we're still a year away from publication of that. But that's where it is. And, um, and so that's, that's how I kind of make it possible for, for, for Lucas to, to behave in the way he does. He does it because he's got political clout and, and, and the marshal service is glad to use his political clout whenever they can. So in a way he's almost a fixer, isn't he? Yes, Yeah. exactly. Well, you know, and we all know how that kind of thing works. So no surprise. I'm just going to segue over here and say that you and I have talked about Letty for I don't know how long. I can't remember how many times I have urged you to write a book about Letty and your fans have urged you to write more about Letty. And um, there were always a couple of obstacles in the way. And I have to tell those of you watching that last fall, I was really worried about John because I wrote to him and I texted him and he didn't reply. And finally, in a panic, I wrote to his wife thinking maybe John was like, you know, in ICU or something. <laughs> it turned out he was in ICU, but it was Letty's ICU. He couldn't figure out what to do, how to make the Letty book work. And so you really go down. I mean, when you're working on a book, you really do just focus entirely on it, don't you? Yeah, uh, pretty much. And the, and the problem with the Letty book is uh, really that I started it a year or so ago. Uh, I wrote it from from about December 4th or 5th of 2020 to just now, five months. And so uh, the thing is, is that I started it out wrong. And so then you, you, you start with a bad beginning or, or a beginning that you know just isn't gonna work because I got about three chapters into it and I said, boy, this is boring. I mean, this is really boring. And, and I, I I couldn't figure out how to get out of it. So I, that was a struggle that I had to take. And what I wound up doing was just trashing it. I kept the idea of a Letty book, but the opening I trashed and, and, I, and I kept one character, but a character who was gonna be like the, the third major character in the book turns out to be just a, he just drops in and drops back out. He just shows up for a few minutes and leaves. And, um, and so, so most of the book got created late. I mean, I, at least I was thinking about it the whole time and, and struggling along with what I was going to do about it. But, but uh, that was, you know, well, that, but the, that idea was, of a is, the idea of a lady book has been around for quite a while. And I'm really delighted that you found a way to, you know, to bring it to fruition. But let's go back to let's go back to Lucas. So he's down there in Florida. He's doing a kind of a whatever he's doing thing. 
Um, and he's got Bob and Ray to help him and other stuff. But at some point, at some point he needs more. And at that point, we managed to get Virgil Flowers, who, as we know, is the cop with sort of a criminal mind. So right. if you really want to do something unorthodox, Virgil's your guy, right? So yes. Virgil comes to Florida. And, 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 and Lucas brings him in to be a, uh, it, it brings him in undercover. And he brings him in as this kind of sleazo, uh, dope smoking guy with a black girlfriend uh, who is Ray. The, the, the woman I've had in four or five novels now. Very good looking woman. And, and uh, she is the smart one and, and Virgil's the stupid one. And, uh, you know, Virgil's got a couple of uh, fake diamonds in his ear about the size of marbles. And I, I say in the book that it would have caused an NBA player to get up from his table and slap him in the face uh, because of these fake things. And, and he wears these cheap blade sunglasses, you know, that cost like a buck 50 from a dollar store or something like that. And, uh, and he's got long hair on his shoulders and stuff like that. And he's just kind of a dirtbag. And, and he just got out of the Iowa State Prison. And, uh, and uh, they asked him how it was. He said, oh, you know, there's three guys to a cell, so it was kind of crude, but, you know, it wasn't tough. And, and uh, so, so he's operating undercover. He's operating undercover as a diver. He's a, as a pro diver from, from L.A. who got run out of L.A. because he slept with the wife of the head of the Los Angeles uh, Police Department's vice squad. And, uh, and so he had, to, he had to leave town and he can't go back. Right. <laughs> He's not allowed back to LA at all. So. It's, a great, it's a great cover story for Virgil. And of course, we already know from the second chapter where the, um, the off-duty Coast Guard man is observing the boat and you know it appears that they're picking up somebody and dive bags are coming in and so forth that diving and whatever's under the ocean is gonna be a key to resolving this. But, you know, Virgil, I mean, I've, you know how much I love the Virgils. I mean, I'm, I'm a Lucas fan forever, but I absolutely adore Virgil. And, and I feel like this is a great role for him. I mean, he is so, you know, off the leash. Um, yeah. and Ray is a, is a great partner for him, in fact, you know, maybe almost too great a partner for him. You do inject a little tension there in their relationship, which I liked. Yeah, because because they're they're both, you know, like they're they're both. They're not going to have an affair. They're, they're just at least at this point they're just not going to have an affair. I mean, Virgil has just had twin babies with his girlfriend. That's right. Uh, but 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 this situation forces them so close together. That that uh, that Virgil at one point says, you know, I can't believe you spent all that time with Bob and nothing was going on, you know, Bob, and uh, and uh, because Bob's Ray's partner, and uh, and she said, well, we are more like brother and sister, and he's like, eh, bullshit, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, it is kind of a funny scene. I liked. It is. It's a great scene. I mean, and Virgil Virgil's partner is a is an interesting woman. She yes. said a number of children with a number of different people. And so, I mean, their whole relationship is truly unorthodox. So you've got, you've got plenty of room to explore it. Um, how, is, how is Virgil able, what, how is he able to be assigned to this thing by Davenport? What does Davenport have to do? Because I mean, Virgil's a cop back in Minnesota. They put him on a federal task force. And this is not uncommon. There's a lot of that going on all the time now with the federal government and various task forces. The FBI needs local guys to work with them. So they create a task force and you can bring people in from the outside because, uh, so that's just, that just gets done a lot. Uh, it gets done more with like the DEA. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, it gets done by the, the feds quite a bit. Neat. So there's an opportunity, one hopes in future books for Virgil to work with Lucas again. Yeah, they could. Really and, uh, you know, but the thing is, that at the end of the book, and this isn't really a spoiler, uh, the last time you see Virgil in the book, he has just sat down at his desk, called up a, a you know, word on his computer, and he types chapter one, because Virgil wants to be a novelist. Uh, he is, he, for the whole series of books, I think he said there are 12 of them, wow. he, has, he has been an, a, a, an outdoor writer. 
He has always written wild, you know, outdoor wildlife, hunting, fishing, shooting, you know, that kind of stories for magazines. But he wants to be a novelist. And so he wrote a novel, it didn't sell. And, uh, and I told him to get in touch with you, but he didn't, the dumbass. But at any rate, but at any rate, uh, so, so it, at last you see of Virgil, he's typing chapter one. I think that maybe in some future book, if I keep writing these books, that, that Lucas will go to a, uh, Lucas will go to a novel, uh, you know, to, to a book show by, that Virgil will be at. He'll be there at a signing, so. Listen, there's bloodthirsty stuff that happens at book shows, you know? I mean, it's not just the boat show, so yeah. I love it. I, I don't want to lose Virgil. I think he's an absolutely great character. I know that you don't, you know, that that writing two books a year is a really hard task. Um, and I realize that you can't keep that up forever, but I don't want Virgil to disappear. So yeah. I love this. I also think, John, this is this book has a lot of humor in it. I mean, you know, your own special brand, some of it's quite dark, but nonetheless, um, a couple of the Davenport Marshall books have not been funny, um, but this book has got a lot of humor in it. You clearly were having a great time writing it and they're having a great time kicking ass in Florida. Yeah. Well, you know, I spent uh, eight or nine years working at the Miami Herald so I kind of know the territory down there and I've got some opinions about a lot of things, just like Carl does, Carl Hyacinth. And, um, and I, when I went back there, I've been back for a long time and I went back there and I even, I mean, I was a reporter almost the whole time I was in Miami. I ran all over all of that territory and I thought I'd do it like the back of my hand and I couldn't find myself sometimes when I was there. I couldn't figure out where things were. It, when I was there, there was this town called Sunrise, which is in the book. And Sunrise was kind of like a little island of houses out in kind of western Broward County, which is Fort Lauderdale County. Um, I, I looked at it and, and Sunrise is right up against the dike for the Everglades. It's right, presses up against it. And one of the characters in my book, a woman, lives in a condo, which is right across the street. And she looks, she could, she could look all the way to Naples if her building was high enough because there's nothing on the other side of this thing except the Everglades. Um, I couldn't really believe it. And the other thing is, is that when I was down there, people would talk about, well, you know, the, the building down here is kind of crappy. You know, it, it's just, it's not, it's not very good quality and, and so on in all these towns in Western Broward County. Well, I went out there this time and honest to God, a lot of those places, I think I, I, I left there 40 years ago, almost 20, yeah, 40 years ago. And those houses are disintegrating. I mean, people said they're bad houses and, and they were bad houses. There a lot of them are just falling apart. It looks, parts of it looks like a giant slum out there. Well, you know, that's not the, the only state where that sort of thing has happened. I'm always surprised when I go back to Southern California and, and how disintegrating much of the architecture, much of the, the housing, in fact, the whole infrastructure is. I mean, when I went to California in 1958 to go to Stanford, it was like on the cutting edge of, you know, infrastructure and modern architecture and all kinds of things. But somehow or other, um, nobody really kept up with it. I've been marveling at PG&E getting away with what, like almost a century or something of not maintaining its, um, you know, his facilities and all. And you think, how the heck did that happen? You can look at Interstate 5 and it's kind of disintegrating and you think, how did that happen? Um, and Florida, oh, I mean, I remember my husband's mother lived in Miami, um, North Miami. And we went to visit a couple of times and, you know, you got all those glamour spots because I'm a child of the 50s. So, you know, Sinatra, the Rat Pack, I mean, they were at the Fountain Blow, you know, it was all this glamour, everything looked so fabulous. I could hardly believe how tacky it was when I got there. Um, you know, it was just, and I mean, Arizona is relatively new and stuff here is really built, most of it, to last. You know, you've been over here. At least new, if nothing else, maybe it won't last, but right now. So I was shocked when I when I got to Florida to see that what I thought was all this wonderful glamour really was not. But that's that's over kind of on the east and down around Miami and North Miami. I, I can't speak to St. Petersburg or Tampa or, you know, 
my uncle my uncle had a beautiful place on Amelia Island. I remember playing golf on Amelia Island like 30 or 40 years ago. It was gorgeous. So I guess Florida is like every other state. It's got, you know. Well, the, the houses that the houses that I'm talking about were not, they weren't good houses to begin with. No. And no. it was not, they were just not stood up. And and uh the, the Miami Beach has been somewhat rehabilitated now. And and uh uh, it's still, Miami Beach is just always going to be cheesy. And if it wasn't cheesy, you probably wouldn't like it because that's just Miami Beach. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but I mean, you know, they've still got, they've still got, you know, Joe's Stone Crab and they've got, they've got, uh, you know, really good delis and all that kind of stuff along the beach. Uh, they've got some nice hotels and, uh, mm -hmm. It's worth it for Joe Stone Crab. And actually, while other people go to Joe Stone Crab House for crab, I go to Joe Stone's Crab House for the key lime pie, which I think is like the best key lime pie ever. But, you know, they weren't building Miami for Minnesota winters, kiddo. You know, they didn't have to go through, um, you know, that, that kind of um, more serious architecture and construction that was going to have to withstand all kinds of stuff. Let me ask you about the background behind you. Where are you in your property doing this broadcast? Is this your artist studio behind you? Yeah, I, I, uh, I have a hobby painter that this painting over here is painted by a Mexican artist. And this painting behind me is one that I'm working on right now, the guy with the halo around his head. And, uh, and, uh, so that's what it is. And this place, see, I, I very carefully placed this computer so it doesn't show what a junk heap it is here. Uh, I mean, I've got crap all over the place, but, but uh, most of it I pushed behind the computer so, so that it's not obvious. And, uh, but that's, yeah, that's what it is back there. It's very nice. The lighting is good. When we've talked to you before in your property in Santa Fe, you've had guitars and other things around. So this is a yet a different facet um, I know Patrick is the person to talk to you about guitar, so maybe we should summon Patrick back up from the black hole and see whether he has some questions to ask, or he could just talk about guitars. Well, uh, I don't want to bore everybody by talking about guitars, but um, we certainly could. Uh, well, there are a bunch of people watching, as always, and asking lots of questions. Um, you know, Roz has been doing a good job of answering most of them, however. <laughs> so I'm not sure how many uh, here. Let's see. Roz is my son. Yeah. Sure there, there's the, you know, the usual. There is the usual question about... Um, you know about TV and movie, anything going on in in, in Hollywood that you know of, or no, oh, I, I don't even keep track of that anymore. I mean, I, I really don't. It sort of annoys my wife when I don't, but I don't. And uh, you know, I, I I'm a book writer, and that's that's where I'm at. So uh, let's see here. Just a lot of people saying how much they love your work. Um, yeah, Corey says I have to say I hope Virgil doesn't go anywhere either. Lucas is great, but Virgil has become my favorite. I think a lot of people are echoing, or some people are echoing that sentiment. Nonetheless, I'm happy for whatever John wants to give us. But please know he has fans that now like Virgil even more. Uh, a number of comments like that. Um, well, you know, I think Virgil will be back. Uh, I don't think, I mean, he'll be back sooner or later. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be back as a cop. He might be back as a writer who gets involved in some kind of criminal kind of thing. And, you know, I'm already starting to think about stuff in my head that, you know, might be done. You know, he comes to the poison pen and Barbara gets killed and he has to, uh, you know, he has That's to- a great uh, exit for me, John. Maybe, you know, everybody's <laughs> want to get rid of me before I'm 85. So <laughs> I'll meet my death with- oh. You know, that's not a bad way to go. I kind of like it. <laughs> um, well, I wouldn't make it easy. Oh, of course not. No, 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 no. <laughs> Now they're starting to come in. <laughs> they're starting to come come in now. Let's see. Uh, uh, Eloise says, "Is John in Santa Fe?" And yes, you are, right? Yes, um, I Santa Fe. Uh, okay, David has a good question. Who is smarter, according to John, Lucas or Virgil? They uh, they they debate that question. Uh, in this current book, uh, Lucas says you're almost as smart and athletic as I am, and, and Virgil says something like, that's fair. 
implying, you know, that it's not fair. <laughs> and, and so um, uh, the, the smartest of the bunch is Letty. And uh, so that's going to work out. Of, that's going to be apparent in the next book. Letty has a master's degree from Stanford in uh, economics and has graduated with distinction. So. so let me pause here and say that there will be the Letty book, as we keep talking about. Does it have a title, John? Uh, it could be The Investigator, a Letty Davenport book. Uh, uh, but not that's a sure years. thing. Yeah. Uh, let me say that I sent this book to New York on Monday. So that today is Tuesday. So yesterday morning, they got it. They, they got the book. Neil Nyron, my editor, uh, and uh, uh, looked at it and right away came back and told me that he likes it a lot. So it's pretty much a done deal at this point. That's wonderful. So it will probably come out about, what, a year from now? April of next year, I think. OK. And then uh, have you written the next Lucas Davenport, or are you about to start it now that you've finished letting? Uh, I am about to take two months off, and I, during that two months, I'm actually going to do something I never do, which is somewhat outline a book, uh, a Davenport book, which I think will get, should be finished by January. You're going to outline a book? Yeah, kind of. Why? I, I, I'm very, very nervous about it, but I think I might, yeah. But why? You haven't been, I mean, what's the impulse behind that? Um... I don't have an impulse. I just, I, I, I've decided I'm gonna take two months off, but I've realized that the way I work, I can't take two months off, but I don't wanna sit in front of that damn computer every day for the next 60 days. And so I'm going to carry a notebook around with me and write notes. In. Got it. So it's a different way of working. Yeah, it's just sort of a, it's just sort of a fake way of working and you know, maybe something will come of it and something won't. Well, ideally, what would happen was that I would have uh, outlined 30 chapters and then I could just go in and tape them up. And, uh, and, uh, but that's not gonna happen. We all know that that's so. Well, I can see that dinner in Santa Fe in July will be more interesting than I had anticipated. <laughs> I love it. Are you gonna be spending more time painting or studying music theory or? I haven't spent- Or just take, time. taking a break. Time. I haven't spent any time painting recently. Uh, uh, I have got a lot of work to do with a dog that's on this back thing. I just got finished scrubbing it with black paint because I realized I'm still learning all this stuff. If you want to paint a white dog, the thing I realized you can't just paint it white. You start out by essentially painting it black because there are going to be all these dark spaces behind the white hair, the shadowed parts. Uh, when you look at a dog, if it was just all white, you wouldn't, all you would see is this white blob. You wouldn't see any definition at all. So you've got to show the shadow, but you can't stripe in every little teeny piece of black. What you've got to do, you've got to start out with dark and then lay in the hair over the top. Of it. So that's what I'm learning how to do right now. But and that's going to take some time. Release the dog from the... <laughs> yeah. Um, David has a question. He says, will we see Shrake and Jenkins again? Yes, if I do another Virgil book, you'll definitely see uh, Shrake and Jenkins. Um, I like those two guys. Uh, I don't think I've had them in a, there've been a couple of books where they haven't been there because Davenport has not been back in Minnesota, but Davenport is going back to Minnesota, I think in this next book. And uh, I may keep the whole thing within the state uh, or I may not. And, um, but I'm thinking that it might be in the next book and this is not a promise or a suggestion, but I'm thinking that Virgil is the one who gets Davenport involved in the next book because, because Virgil has a serious problem that crosses state lines. And uh, I don't know which state lines, but some state line, probably down into Iowa or North Dakota or could be over into Wisconsin someplace, but at any rate, he needs somebody who can cross state lines and that would be Lucas. Sounds wonderful. Actually, it doesn't sound like much, I don't think. Uh, because Come I on, yes, it does. You're just beginning. There's a, there's a question. What's that? I'm just saying. I was just going to say, there's a question here about co-writers, co how you worked with, uh, was it Katine? Is that how you say his name? Yes. Katine. I'm always, 
I got it right this time. Wow. Uh, for Saturn run. And there's some, some definite fans of that here. Do you have any, any, uh, plans of doing other collaborative co collaborative efforts like that? I don't know. I, I really don't. I mean, it was fun writing. I, I've collaborated a couple of times with different people, including with my wife. Um, uh, and, and it was sort of fun doing it, but it slows things down. And uh, because, because you've got to go back and deal with that. Now, uh, uh, we've got a guy here in town, Doug Preston, uh, uh, you know, who you guys know because he comes out there all the time. Uh, Preston and Child collaborated on everything, well, not on everything, but they collaborated on their main line of books. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know actually how they do it, but, but uh, whether they alternate chapters or, I, because I don't think that they're living in the same place most of the time. So I don't know exactly how they do it, but, but some people can do that easily and, and I can't. I've tried it and I, and I can't. What I would like to do is, is uh, you know, do one of those things where you die and then somebody writes your books for 50 more years. And uh, I prefer to leave, want to leave out the dying part. And just have somebody write, you know, my books for the fifty one. <laughs> no, that that that's that's not a great plan, John. Let's let's reconsider it. Let's keep you. Well, alive. Robert Parker's been dead for twenty years now. I think his books keep coming out, and they got a good writer too. Ace is a good writer. He's and a good uh, so, fair question. He's terrific. I know, you know, uh, Reed Farrell Coleman, he, uh, he has a great story about, you know, when he started doing those Robert B. Parker books, Barbara, I think you've heard him tell this one where he was at an event with Larry Block, you know, and Larry mentioned something about this collaboration. And uh, Reed said, well, you know, I, I think I, I would really be more suited to the Matthew Scudder books. And Larry uh, held his arm up and he goes, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh man, Larry Block. Uh, Larry Block is uh, gave me the only tip I ever used as a writer, was and that, that was to throw away your first chapter. And what he was saying was, get rid of all that stuff where you where you're setting scenes and everything like that. Just start telling the story right from the start. And so, so in the in the Letty book, which I just finished and it's just all over my head right now. Uh, let, it, it starts with Letty breaking into a building in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, burglarizing it essentially, and uh, uh, for good cause. But I mean, I mean, I open it with Letty hiding in a hedge outside the building, waiting for somebody to leave, uh, and and so so the story is going with the first sentence of the book, and I think that that's what. I never I really talked to him about it. I've met him, Larry, a few times, but uh, he he uh, he said, "Throw away your first chapter," which meant, "Don't do." You know, the sun was coming up, and the grass was growing, and the trees were blowing in the wind, and dogs are barking in the distance, and you heard a backfire and all. Don't do that. Just start saying, you know, Jim Jones stuck a gun in the guy's ear and said, "Don't move, or I'll pull the trigger." And the guy moved. Okay. If anybody's a writer and they want to use that line, you can use it. <laughs> the Raymond Chandler had that famous line. line. What? That Raymond Chandler line about when in doubt, have a guy bust through the door with a gun in his hand. Yeah, right. When in doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. Howard has a question here, which is a good one. He says, good to have Lucas back in his old stomping grounds. I always liked Sloan. He was always a balancing force for Lucas. Will he make a return? Well, Sloan runs a bar now. And uh, Lucas goes over there and plays poker from time to time. And uh, so Sloan probably is, you're not going to see too much of him. And you know, the character that I'd really like to bring back is the nun, uh, who was prominent about the first four or five books. She was sort of a psychological consultant for, for, for Lucas. Uh, Sloan was sort of like the guy who asked Lucas's questions would, he'd ask Lucas questions and Lucas would answer them, which would lead to the solution. Uh, but the but the sister, the, the the nun, was the person who told Lucas sometimes, you know, what to look for. So 
So I think she was a good character, and, and uh, I, I'd like to get her back. Into well, if you bring Lucas back to Minnesota in the next book, then in theory, you could also bring in the nun. I could bring the whole gang back, actually. You know, I could have, you know, Jenkins and Shrake. And, and uh, for people who don't know Jenkins and Shrake, Jenkins and Shrake were both sports writers from Texas who both worked for Sports Illustrated. And Dan Jenkins was a friend of mine. And I, I actually played golf with Bud Shrake. Uh, Bud was uh, the companion of, of the Texas governor, uh, whose name I'm blanking on right now. Very famous lady. Uh, she only saw Ann Richards. Her. Yes, she was. He was Ann Richards' companion for like twenty years, and and both of them were just. They were hangout guys. They were guys, you know, that you could talk to on the street corner for two hours. And uh, Dan Jenkins' daughter is a, a superb sports writer for the Washington Post. Drake was a really terrific writer too. Uh, I've read some of some of his novels. Well, Shrake has also did a number of uh, of plays. I mean, you know, the, the legitimate type, legitimate stage type plays and stuff like that. I think one yeah. of the last things he did was a play that was produced in London. Yeah, he wrote Blessed McGill and um, a big historical novel, Barbara, that we carried. I can't remember what it was. It was a, a big Texas uh, historical, a big epic some years ago. They, um, they, they were known to have a martini on occasion too, the two of them. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea for a book. Take him home and bring the gang back. I like that. I mean, that, that really would be fun for your fans. Yeah, it could be. But you know, one of the things is, is that if you have too many characters that you have to kind of reprise and you have to kind of talk about, it kind of reduces the velocity of the book. Well, I'm sure you're up to figuring out how to accomplish bringing them back and keeping velocity. Yep. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it, it takes some work to do that. Of course it does, but you're up for it. Anything else there, Patrick? Yeah, there, there are a couple of comments about, about the audio book version of your, you know, of this latest book in particular. And Richard Ferrone, is it Ferroni or Ferrone? Um, and people are commenting just about it, what, a, what a terrific narrator he is. Did you have any part in that? Casting I decision. Have, I, don't, I don't have any part in that at all. And I don't really listen to my books very often when I do on occasion, but he is like the best. And, and, I, and I mean, he does that so well that, uh, you know, that by the time I get finished doing these books, uh, I've been through them eight or 10 times, literally eight or 10 times. I've been over the first few chapters, maybe 20 times, and the last chapters, maybe 20 times. Although in the Letty book, I blew the last line and I switched words and, I, and, it, and it made a dramatic line into something absolutely absurd and it's been fixed, but it was funny. But at any rate, uh, so, so uh, I'm tired of my own books and that's why I don't listen to them too much, but I have listened to them a few times. And the guy is terrific. I mean, it kind of reminds you of those old, you know, radio plays from the end of the forties when they were really into that kind of, that kind of stuff when, when you know you could really get a lot of drama on the radio and he, he's just really good at it oh i miss those you know the shadow lamont Crasnan, only the shadow knows there were some really fabulous radio plays and you know they were they really turned your imagination loose i remember as a kid you know i would hide under the covers because my parents would have been really cross and i would listen to like the lux radio theater or was a suspense that had that horrible creaking door. And, you know, it, it, it really, the radio could scare you silly because it was all in, in your own head and imagination when you listened to it. And, it. and there were some that were so bigoted that you'd one screaming from the house if you were doing it today. I'm sure you're right. I mean, some, <laughs> of, those, some of those Amos and Andy shows. Yeah, or, you know. Or just, I mean, it's the kind of thing that makes your head explode. It's like, oh, oh my God. But, you know, Fibber McGee's closet will always be with us. Even my husband, you know, every once in a while, and he looks at his office, will reference Fibber McGee's closet. So some of those things remain classic. Yeah. Anything else there, Patrick? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Laura uh, asks, will John consider teaching a master class? Maybe. 
I mean, uh, you mean a Zoom master class or something like that? What, what I mean wasn't is there that 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 subscription master classes? I know a lot of you know, like Joyce Carol Oates and Walter Mosley and other writers have participated in that. Well, I think know, it's a I, series. I, I talk about that stuff at, at uh, the convention uh, in New York. That that uh, Thriller Fest. Yeah, the Thriller Fest. I, I I will talk to people about that. Um, I'll tell you what, the next time I come to, to uh, Scottsdale, why don't I teach a uh, master class in your store starting about two o'clock and you could limit it to like 10 people or something like that. 10 people who are actually trying to write a novel. We and, do that. And, and we could do that for a couple hours just to see what people think. Because I have a lot of thoughts about the way novels are written and, and how you do it. I think that would be wonderful. And if you decide to do what I love, this is this is what Jan says to me. He will say, I'm going to come to Scottsdale and I'm going to do a little light shopping, often for a Mercedes or something. But still, if you get the urge to come and do a little light shopping, you know, anytime, um, we could certainly we could certainly set up a class. That'd be great. But we got to wait until the until the COVID is gone. Because well, it's going to be gone. It's only going to be if we are reasonably defensed against it. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, we're fortunate that here, the staff, um, we've all had our shots, at least one shot by now, haven't we, Patrick? I think everybody on staff has had one. Just about, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, I got my two shots of Moderna, same thing you've got, uh, in Amarillo, Texas, because Amarillo uh, apparently had a pretty good supply of vaccine based on its population but a lot of Texans don't want it. So they weren't getting it. So they just opened the doors to all comers. And so I would, hundreds of people from New Mexico where we can't get it, crossed the border and, and went to Amarillo where they were welcoming. Like, Everybody come on in, you know, it's like, uh, come and get your shots. And, and so we did and we got our shots and it was cool. How interesting. Hmm. That's something, gosh. Well, um, there. Here's a, here's a more serious, uh, query and several people have kind of brought up you know what's been going on in Minneapolis lately and um, whether you had any thoughts about it uh, and whether it will have any effect on future books well you know it's uh, I don't know but, but the fact of the matter is and I've got I could probably talk about this for a half an hour but it's been pretty horrifying and um, it, it really has been and I, I don't my, my basic feeling is that there are about 20 to 25% of cops should not be on the street. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, there, there are cops who are burned out. There are cops who are not very bright. Uh, there are cops who are not very well trained. There are all kinds of reasons, but about 20 to 25% shouldn't be out there. They're dangerous. And sometimes they don't know it. And some of them have racial problems and some of them, have, but, but people come up with all these solutions. Uh, I mean, all these suggestions, like maybe they should be more like social workers. If somebody tells you they should be more like social workers, those are somebody who hasn't talked to social workers because I have talked to social workers and I say that many of them are more burned out than the cops are because, because they, they go through the same BS day after day after day. They see people doing the same kind of bad behavior time after time after time and they get burned out. But the problem is, what do you do about that? If somebody is eight years into their career and you tell them you can't do this anymore, you gotta quit. Uh, maybe there should be, a, maybe there should be a, some kind of a deal where you can only be a cop for 10 years. Because, and, then, and, then, and then you gotta do something else. They give you another job in state government or city government or something like that. But, uh, but I, I, I'm looking at these things that happen. And, and this woman who shot the guy yesterday you just shake your head. She thought she had a taser. Doesn't she know what a taser feels like? Didn't they train her on the taser so that she would tell just by the feel that it was a taser and it wasn't a pistol and it was a pistol and it wasn't a taser? I mean, but, but the thing is, that's not the first time it happened. If you guys look on the internet, I think it was in Oklahoma about two or three years ago, an elderly man who, who volunteered to be a cop had no training pulled out his nine millimeter pistol thinking it was a taser and shot the guy right in the back of the neck and killed him. And it was a black guy uh, who got killed. And, and, and then this, this kid who got 
who got stopped yesterday. I mean, what a nightmare. It's just a nightmare. And um, I think that what you have to do is you have to lose 25% of the cops. And, uh, but then, then you start to talk about the reality of it and it gets so difficult because, because the cops, uh, the cops feel so put upon, they feel so oppressed themselves. They are out there and they're doing an awful job and it's dangerous and it's violent and they're, and they're always in trouble out there. And, and, and one of the reactions to this kind of trouble is that they formed the most powerful unions in the country. And those unions are set up to protect the cops at any cost. And uh, so they're protecting their children as much as, much as they can. Um, and, uh, and what they do is that they, they threaten the politicians and the politicians wanna keep their jobs at almost any cost. Uh, boy, I mean, it's just such a complete conundrum, uh, but, but you just, and there's, there is no question in my mind, by the way, that, that uh, that, that black people in general are victims of a really systematic racism uh, that pervades government. It's not just cops. And, um, and, and the odd thing I find about it is that, is that uh, the odd thing that I find about it is that, is that a, a lot of the cops now are black or Hispanic. Uh, I think that in that case, case in Virginia, just that just came up where the guy uh, uh, pepper sprayed the, the army lieutenant, the black army lieutenant tried to drag him out of his car. I think that guy was Hispanic. So, so you have all these racial conflicts going on and things that shouldn't be racial conflicts that are called blue on black uh, because it's a cop on, cop can be any race, you know, uh, but, he's, but he's blue. What do you do about that? I mean, you can't say we can fix this by having more black cops because, because black cops are blue. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know what you say about all that, but it's it's just a, it's just an impossible knot to cut. It's just a Gordian knot and and with little steel bars on the outside, so you can't cut it. You raise a really interesting point about term limits. I mean, we here in my household, we've talked a lot about term limits for politicians. <laughs> what is wrong? in my opinion, with Washington is because there are no term limits except for the president. Um, and, you know, you, you wind up with justices serving too long. You wind up with people in the Senate age 90 something that, you know, I mean, I'm an old person and, and, you know, at some point I'll have to face that. But I think that if we had term limits and we didn't have politicians there for life and we didn't have all that, that it would make a big difference. I, I agree with you, but with cops, it's difficult because cops are so expensive. But then, what do you do with them if you say you can only be a cop for ten years? No, what do you do with them for the rest of a, a thirty-year career? Uh, you can't just you can't just you can't just discard them, you know. And so and so it becomes tough. And and some cops are perfectly good for thirty years, but but I think an awful lot of, especially street cops, are not. And 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 our 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 entertainment. Our entertainment uh, culture, you know, showing cops uh, not misbehaving. They're, you know, they're, they shoot people that's funny, or they shoot people and they're really cynical about it. Or they shoot people, and most cops aren't cynical about shooting people. They don't want to shoot people. Uh, so, I mean, most cops. So, I, I mean, it's it's just like a great human conundrum, is what it is. It's a lot of pressure situations in which people don't always behave rationally or you know how do how do many of us know what we would do if we were facing what we thought was a real threat it's very difficult i think unfortunately, our gun culture has you know made it so easy to i mean every day now there are shootings every day you know more than one so well you know one of the things one of the things that, that bothers me has to do with the media and most of the media and the specifically commentators not the news people so much they don't understand what they're talking about, but they talk about it anyway, and they talk about it forever. Uh, the one example that I used is that three cops on a really hardcore detail in New York City thought a guy came through uh, out of a uh, building with a gun, and somebody shouted gun, and they shot him like 14 times, okay? And, and I mean, it's a horrifying, the guy was unarmed, pretty horrifying situation, all that kind of stuff, but when they 
They keep coming back. They shot him 14 times. They shot him 14 times. Well, you got three guys. That's five shots apiece. Five shots apiece can be a second and a half. Uh, they don't understand that cops are dealing with what they, you know, they're, they're, they fear for their own lives. They're out there in the dark. They don't know what's going on. Somebody screamed gun and they fire five shots a second and a half. It's that long. And, and it's not something that they're sitting there and contemplating and thinking about and squeezing off a shot every minute or so or anything like that. It's like, boom, and it's over with. But it's 14 shots with three guys. And so, and so uh, the commentators don't talk about that. They talk about it as if the cops are able to contemplate what's about to happen. And they're not. They're reacting. And that's, I suspect, what happened with this woman who shot the guy in, I don't think she wanted to kill the guy. Uh, but she did, and and um, and I think she's going to pay for it because it's it's, it's negligence of nothing else. You got to know the difference between what a what a taser feels like and what a pistol feels like. And she did even after twenty six years in the police force. What does that mean? So anyway, I get pretty wound up because I write about cops. I've known cops forever. I like cops, but their job is is almost become impossible now. I agree. And as I said, which one of us knows what we would do in a moment like that? Patrick, is there anything else? Uh, well, Ben Ben comes in and he said, well, the founders envisioned term limits for sure, which is a good, uh, well put. Um, let's see. Just a lot of bravo, bravo, agreed. <laughs> no comments like that. Um, so we veered off a little of course. And <laughs> we, we, we digress a little bit, but. You know, oh well. Do you think uh, do you think uh, nat some some form of national service would be beneficial in some way? Well, I don't know. You know, the fact is, I, I was I spent two years in the army, and uh, I would not give those two years back uh, for anything because because it did a lot for me. People who went in the army or drafted and went in the army grew up there. Uh, I see. I mean, people speak jokingly of snowflakes and young people not being, if you, okay, for one thing, the army was simple, simple and stupid. If you couldn't get through the army, you couldn't change a tire. I mean, I mean, you know, like the Marine Corps is supposed to have all this tough thing. Look at guys who turn out to be Marines. I mean, we're not talking about geniuses and we're not talking about great physical specimens either. We're just talking about guys who became Marines and that, that was the high point in their life. But it does something to people. And, it, and, it, and, it, and the Army and the Marine Corps and the Air Force and the Coast Guard and, and the Navy give people heavy responsibility when they're like 20 years old. And that makes a huge difference. My boss at the Pioneer Press in St. Paul said that she could tell a veteran by talking to one for a couple of minutes because, because your attitude changes. Uh, most kids, when they, if they, I mean, I mean, a lot of kids, you know, grow up, get jobs, work hard, do, and they're fine, they're adults. Uh, but most people, when they come out of the army, they're an adult. They, or when they come out of the military, they're an adult because they, they've had to do serious stuff and they don't have any choice. If they don't do it, they're going to put them in jail. So it's not like, you know, well, maybe I'll do it or maybe I won't, or maybe I'll go get a latte someplace, but uh, but uh, that's not what you do. I mean- Well, it provides structure. And that takes us all the way back to the beginning of this whole conversation, which is this kid who was not being a big success at life and he right. was the Coast Guard. And then comes a situation in which he is tested. So um, all of that, reinforces what John has just said. Patrick, I think that we've pushed past the hour quite a bit. So unless yeah. there's a closing question, let me thank John. It's always a pleasure, John, to be with you. It's a great treat to launch your book. Let me say again that we do have still autographed copies of Ocean Prey, which I think is just a fabulous Lucas Davenport, virtual flowers, lots of fun, great plot, lots of humor, boats. A market all right. Show, right? So, Thank you all for watching this. It will be a podcast available tomorrow. It will live on our Facebook video page forever. So do tell your friends if they missed it. They can download and listen to it or they can watch it. John, thank you. Patrick, thank you again for your terrific as ever producer role. And um, enjoy your evening, everybody. Good night. Good night.